Hello everyone. Previous class we discussed about the anatomy of all the four joints that form the shoulder complex. That is glenohumeral joint, sternoclavicular joint, acromioclavicular joint and scapulothoracic joint. We also discussed about the osteokinematics that occur in these joints. That is movements occurring at these joints, its range of motion and the planes and axis where the movement occur. Now we will discuss about the arthrokinematics of these joints. So first we will start with glenohumeral joint as it is easy to understand and before discussing about the arthrokinematics we have to understand the concave convex rule. So let us recall what is concave convex rule. When the concave moves on convex you can see in this animation the concave surface of the bone is moving on convex surface of the bone. So when the concave moves on convex the sliding will be towards the same direction of the movement of the bone. You can see here the bone is moving downward sliding also is downward. When the bone is moving out upward sliding also is upward. Okay. So sliding will be always in the same direction towards the movement of the bone if concave surface is moving on convex. For convex moving on concave, the sliding will be in the opposite direction. You can view this animation. When the bone is moving downward, sliding is upward. Okay, So you can see the sliding is in the opposite direction. When the bone is moving upward, sliding is downward. So when convex moves on concave surface, sliding is always in the opposite direction to the movement of bone. So once we have understood the concave convex rule, then we'll discuss about the arthrokinematics during abduction and adduction movement. So during abduction, the humerus moves on scapula. The bone moves superiorly and the humerus as the humerus is moving on scapula that is the convex surface of the humerus head of the humerus is moving on the concave surface of the scapula that is glenoid cavity so when convex moves on concave the sliding will be in the opposite direction therefore during abduction the bone is moving upward sliding of the head of the humerus will be downward You can use the term as superiorly and inferiorly. The bone will be moving superiorly whereas the sliding will be inferiorly during abduction. And during adduction, the bone will be moving downward and sliding will be upward. You can see in this picture during abduction that is direction is upward. The rolling of the head of the humerus will be upward. Sliding will be opposite. That is because the convex surface is moving on concave surface where the sliding will be opposite to the movement of the bone. Now why this sliding is important? As we already know the head of the humerus is larger than the glenoid cavity. Therefore if it doesn't slide then it will come out of the socket of the glenoid cavity and gets dislocated or it impinges the structures above here. Because if there is no downward slide, then it will be shifting upward, rolling upward and then impinging the structures here. Therefore, the head of the humerus has to slide downward on the glenoid cavity while the humerus goes for abduction. So you can read out here, humeral head could impinge subacromial content after 22 degrees of abduction as the humeral head longitudinal size is much greater than the glenoid fossa that is 1.9 times bigger than the glenoid fossa therefore sliding is important for creating more movement so in this picture you can see how the head of the humerus can impinge the supraspinatus tendon on the acromion process as the supraspinatus tendon is in the subacromial space Next arthrokinematic movement we will discuss is for flexion and extension. We know the arthrokinematic movements are sliding, spinning and rolling. During flexion and extension the head of the humerus will just spin on the glenoid cavity. That is the arthrokinematic movement during flexion and extension.
there will be simple spinning motion of the humeral head on the glenoid fossa. Now coming to arthrokinematics during internal and external rotation. So this is external rotation, just I am correcting here, external rotation. So what will be the direction of the slide of the head of the humerus during external rotation? During external rotation, the head of the humerus is rolling posteriorly, right? Because the convex surface is moving on concave, the sliding will be anteriorly during external rotation. Again, I will repeat, during external rotation, the head of the humerus is rolling posteriorly. Therefore, the sliding will be anteriorly. Why the sliding is in opposite direction to the movement of the bone? Because the convex surface is moving on concave and the reverse will happen for internal rotation that is during internal rotation the head of the humerus will be rolling anteriorly whereas sliding will be posteriorly but if the glenohumeral joint is abducted to 90 degree and then internal and external rotation is performed then there will be only spinning of the head of the humerus on the glenoid fossa if the internal and external rotation is performed at 90 degree abducted position of the glenohumeral joint. Now coming to arthrokinematics during elevation and depression at sternoclavicular joint. We have to understand that the sternoclavicular joint has saddle shaped articulating surfaces. So therefore during elevation and depression the convex surface of the clavicle moves on the concave surface of the sternum so during elevation the bone is moving upward and the sliding will be downward because convex surface of the clavicle is moving on concave surface of the sternum now during protraction and retraction of the clavicle on the sternum as we already know it has a saddle shaped joint surfaces therefore it has concave as well as convex surface on both the articulating surfaces that is articulating surface of the clavicle has concave structure horizontally and convex surface vertically similarly the sternum has convex surface horizontally and concave surface vertically during retraction the clavicle is moving posteriorly Therefore, the sliding also will be in same direction. Why? Because concave surface of the clavicle is moving on convex surface of the sternum. And during protraction, the clavicle moves anteriorly and sliding also will be anteriorly. Now coming to kinetics of the shoulder complex. So before discussing the kinetics, there are two important topics here in kinetics of the shoulder complex or glenohumeral joint that is static stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint and dynamic stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint first we'll discuss about the static stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint for that we have to revise some of the anatomical structures of the glenohumeral joint the first structure is glenoid labrum have you heard glenoid labrum it is around the glenoid cavity so it acts as a static stabilizer glenoid labrum how does it act as a sta static stabilizer by deepening the glenoid cavity so because of the glenoid labrum 50% of the depth for glenoid cavity is increased and it also increases the area of contact for humeral head next structure is the glenohumeral capsule the fibrous capsule forms the rim of the glenoid fossa to anatomic neck of the humerus you can see in the picture here it comes from the rim of the glenoid fossa till the anatomical neck of the humerus the synovial membrane lines the inner wall of the capsule it is loose fitting and expandable on the inferior aspect of the glenohumeral joint this capsule forms like a pouch structure inferiorly which is called as axillary pouch it is about 2.5 centimeter in length this glenohumeral capsule thickens anterior inferior wall of capsule 
It offers slight suction because of which negative pressure is created inside the glenoid cavity. This negative pressure will suck in the head of the humerus inside the glenoid cavity, increasing the stability of the joint. Then we have glenohumeral ligament. We have superior glenohumeral ligament. It is from the proximal, the proximal attachment of this ligament is near supraglenoid tubercle and distally this ligament is attached to the anatomical neck just above the lesser tubercle. This ligament is taut during full adduction preventing the inferior translation of the head of the humerus. Next part of the glenohumeral ligament is the middle glenohumeral ligament. Proximally it, its attachment is from the anterior rim of the glenoid fossa and distally it is attached to the anterior aspect of the anatomical neck. This ligament blends with subscapularis muscle and it is taut in 45 to 60 degree of abduction. This ligament restricts anterior translation and extreme external rotation. Next part of the glenohumeral ligament is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. Its proximal attachment is at the anterior inferior rim of glenoid fossa and distally it is attached to the anterior inferior and posterior inferior margins of the anatomical neck. It is attached as two band that is anterior and posterior band where anterior band is thick. This inferior glenohumeral ligament forms a pouch inferiorly which is called as axillary pouch. Next ligament is the coracohumeral ligament. The coracohumeral ligament comes from the coracoid process to the humerus. As the name suggests, it strengthens the capsule. It comes from the lateral border of the coracoid process to the anterior side of the greater tubercle. It blends with the superior capsule and supraspinatus tendon. This ligament is taut during adduction and it restricts inferior and superior translation of the humeral head. Now coming to the main topic that is static stabilization of the glenohumeral joint. So static stabilization means the stabilization of glenohumeral joint when muscles are not contracted. That is when the muscle is in relaxed state what structures stabilize the glenohumeral joint? As we know, when the arm is by the side, the humerus and the upper limb is pulled downward by gravity. So muscle electrical activity during static position will be nil. So why humerus does not dislocate inferiorly because of the gravitational pull? Because the glenoid is inclinated superiorly as we have already discussed in the anatomy. So therefore there is slight stabilization because of the inclination of the glenoid cavity. The resultant pull of gravity compresses the humeral head to the lower glenoid fossa. Because of the slight inclination of the glenoid cavity, the head of the humerus is compressed on the inferior aspect of the glenoid fossa. Next stabilization is because of the vacuum that is created with the capsule. So the glenohumeral capsule creates a negative pressure inside the joint because of which the head of the humerus is sucked in the glenoid fossa. Next structure which stabilizes the glenohumeral joint in static position is the coracohumeral ligament. It doesn't allow inferior as well as superior translation of the head of the humerus. Another point which is not mentioned here is the glenoid labrum which we already discussed that glenoid labrum increases the depth of the glenoid fossa. Therefore, it gives more surface for the head of the humerus to attach to the glenoid fossa. So therefore, glenoid labrum also increases the static stability of the glenohumeral joint.